The belief that disembodied spirits may be permitted to revisit this world, has its foundation upon that sublime hope of immortality which is at once the chief solace and greatest triumph of our reason. But in the early days of little knowledge this grand belief became the source of a whole train of superstitions, which, in their turn, became the fount from whence flowed a deluge of blood and horror. Europe, for a period of two centuries and a half, brooded upon the idea, not only that parted spirits walked the earth to meddle in the affairs of men, but that men had power to summon evil spirits to their aid to work woe upon their fellows. An epidemic terror seized upon the nations, no person thought themselves secure, either in his person or possessions, from the machinations of the devil and his agents. Every calamity that befell him he attributed to a witch. If a storm arose and blew down his barn, it was witchcraft, if his cattle died, if disease fastened upon his limbs, or death entered suddenly and snatched a beloved face from his hearth, they were not visitations of providence, but the works of some neighboring hag, whose wretchedness or insanity caused the ignorant to raise their finger and point at her as a witch. The word was upon everybody's tongue. France, Italy, Germany, England, Scotland, and the far north successively ran mad upon this subject, and for a long series of years furnished their tribunals with so many trials for witchcraft, that other crimes were seldom or never spoken of. Thousands upon thousands of unhappy persons fell victims to this cruel and absurd delusion. In many cities of Germany the average number of executions for this pretended crime was 600 annually, or two every day, if we leave out the Sundays, when it is to be supposed that even this madness refrained from its work. A misunderstanding of the famous text of the Mosaic Law, Thou shalt not suffer a witch to live, no doubt led many conscientious men astray, whose superstition, warm enough before, wanted but a little corroboration to blaze out with desolating fury. From the best authorities, it appears that the Hebrew word used in the earliest text means a diviner, a dabbler in spells, or fortune teller. The medieval witch was a very different character, and joined to their pretended power of foretelling future events that of working evil upon the life, limbs, and possessions of mankind. This power was only to be acquired by an express compact, signed in blood, with the devil himself, by which the wizard or which renounced baptism, and sold his or her immortal soul to the evil one, without any saving clause of redemption. Before entering further into the history of witchcraft, we must make acquaintance with the source, and understand what sort of a personage it was who gave the witches, in exchange for their souls, the power to torment their fellow creatures. It was believed by divines generally, and by people at large, that a mighty onslaught upon the Christian world was soon to be made, by the devil and his infernal hosts, and that the final battle between Satan and the Church, was shortly to come off. In comparison with the approaching contest, all other wars, even that for the recovery of the Holy Sepulchre, paled their light. It was the Great Crusade, in which hostile powers, Muslim, Papal, and Pagan, of every kind, on earth and from hell, were to go down. It was because a minister entertained these ideas, that he was on the watch to hear, and prompt and glad to meet, the first advances of the diabolical legions. The popular notion of the devil was, that he was a large, ill-formed, hairy sprite, with horns, a long tail, cloven feet, and dragon's wings. In this shape he was constantly brought on the stage by the monks in their early miracles and mysteries. In these representations he was an important personage, and answered the purpose of the clown in the modern pantomime. The great fun for the people was to see him well belabored by the saints with clubs or cudgels, and to hear him howl with pain as he limped off, maimed by the blow of some vigorous saint. This was paying him in his own coin, and amused the populace mightily, for they all remembered the scurvy tricks he had played them and their forefathers. It was believed that he endeavored to trip people up by laying his long invisible tail in their way, and giving it a sudden whisk when their legs were over it. That he used to get drunk, and swear like a sailor, and be so mischievous in his cups as to raise tempests and earthquakes, to destroy the fruits of the earth, and the barns and homesteads of true believers. In all the stories circulated and believed about him, he was represented as an ugly, 
petty, mischievous spirit, who rejoiced in playing off all manner of fantastic tricks upon poor humanity. Milton seems to have been the first who succeeded in giving any but a ludicrous description of him. The sublime pride, which is the quintessence of evil, was unknown before his time. All other writers made him merely grotesque, but Milton made him awful. In this the monks showed themselves but miserable romancers, for their object undoubtedly was to represent the fiend as terrible as possible. But there was nothing grand about their Satan, on the contrary, he was a low, mean devil, whom it was easy to circumvent, and fine fun to play tricks with. Besides this chief personage, there was an infinite number of inferior demons, who played conspicuous parts in the creed of witchcraft. It was thought that the earth swarmed with millions of demons of both sexes, many of whom, like the human race, traced their lineage up to Adam, who after the fall was led astray by devils, assuming the forms of beautiful women to deceive him. These demons increased and multiplied among themselves, with the most extraordinary rapidity. Although they increased among themselves like ordinary creatures, their numbers were daily augmented by the souls of wicked men, of children still born, of women who died in childbirth, and of persons killed in duels. Their bodies were of the thin air, and they could pass through the hardest substances with the greatest ease. They had no fixed residence or abiding place, but were tossed to and fro in the immensity of space. When thrown together in great multitudes, they excited whirlwinds in the air and tempests in the waters, and took delight in destroying the beauty of nature and the monuments of the industry of man. The whole air was supposed to be full of them, and many unfortunate men and women drew them by thousands into their mouths and nostrils at every inspiration, and the demons, lodging in their bowels or other parts of their bodies, tormented them with pains and diseases of every kind, and sent them frightful dreams. Saint Gregory of Nice relates a story of a nun who forgot to make the sign of the cross before she sat down to supper, and who in consequence swallowed a demon concealed among the leaves of a lettuce. Most persons said the number of these demons was so great that they could not be counted, but one scholar asserted that they amounted to no more than 7,405,926, and that they were divided into 72 companies or battalions, to each of which there was a prince or captain. They could assume any shape they pleased. When they were male, they were called incubi, and when female, succubi. They sometimes made themselves hideous, and at other times they assumed shapes of such transcendent loveliness, that mortal eyes never saw beauty to compete with theirs. All these demons were at the command of any individual who would give up his immortal soul to the prince of evil for the privilege of enjoying their services for a stated period. The wizard or witch could send them to execute the most difficult missions, whatever the witch commanded was performed, except it was a good action, in which case the order was disobeyed, and evil worked upon herself instead. If Satan himself appeared in human shape, he was never perfectly and in all respects like a man. He was either too black or too white, too large or too small, or some of his limbs were out of proportion to the rest of his body. Most commonly his feet were deformed, and he was obliged to curl up and conceal his tail in some part of his habiliments, for, take what shape he would, he could not get rid of that encumbrance. He sometimes changed himself into a tree or a river, and upon one occasion he transformed himself into a lawyer according to a monk named Wyrus. At intervals, according to the pleasure of Satan, there was a general meeting of the demons and all the witches. This meeting was called the Sabbath, from its taking place on the Saturday, or immediately after midnight on Fridays. These Sabbaths were sometimes held for one district, sometimes for another, and once at least every year it was held among other high mountains, as a general Sabbath of the fiends for the whole of Christendom. The devil generally chose a place where four roads met as the scene of this assembly, or if that was not convenient, the neighborhood of a lake. Upon this spot nothing would ever afterwards grow, as the hot feet of the demons and witches burnt the principle of fecundity from the earth, and rendered it barren forever. When orders had been once issued for the meeting of the Sabbath, 
all the wizards and witches who failed to attend it were lashed by demons with a rod made of serpents or scorpions, as a punishment for their inattention or want of punctuality. In France and England the witches were supposed to ride uniformly upon broomsticks, but in Italy and Spain, the devil himself, in the shape of a goat, used to transport them on his back, which lengthened or shortened according to the number of witches he was desirous of accommodating. No witch, when proceeding to the Sabbath, could get out by a door or window, were she to try ever so much. Their general mode of ingress was by the keyhole, and of egress by the chimney, up which they flew, broom and all, with the greatest ease. To prevent the absence of the witches from being noticed by their neighbors, some inferior demon was commanded to assume their shapes and lie in their beds, feigning illness, until the Sabbath was over. When all the wizards and witches had arrived at the place of rendezvous, the infernal ceremonies of the Sabbath began. Satan, Having assumed his favorite shape of a large he goat, with a face in front and another in his haunches, took his seat upon a throne, and all present, in succession, paid their respects to him, and kissed him in his face behind. This done, he appointed a master of the ceremonies, in company with whom he made a personal examination of all the wizards and witches, to see whether they had the secret mark about them by which they were stamped as the devil's own. This mark was always insensible to pain. Those who had not yet been marked, received the mark from the master of the ceremonies, the devil at the same time bestowing nicknames upon them. This done, they all began to sing and dance in the most furious manner, until someone arrived who was anxious to be admitted into their society. They were then silent for a while, until the newcomer had denied his salvation, kissed the devil, spat upon the Bible, and sworn obedience to him in all things. They then began dancing again with all their might. In the course of an hour or two they generally became wearied of this violent exercise, and then they all sat down and recounted the evil deeds they had done since their last meeting. Those who had not been malicious and mischievous enough towards their fellow creatures, received personal chastisement from Satan himself, who flogged them with thorns or scorpions till they were covered with blood, and unable to sit or stand. When this ceremony was concluded, they were all amused by a dance of toads. Thousands of these creatures sprang out of the earth, and standing on their hind legs, danced, while the devil played the bagpipes or the trumpet. These toads were all endowed with the faculty of speech, and entreated the witches to reward them with the flesh of unbaptized babes for their exertions to give them pleasure. The witches promised compliance. The devil bade them remember to keep their word, and then stamping his foot, caused all the toads to sink into the earth in an instant. The place being thus cleared, preparation was made for the banquet, where all manner of disgusting things were served up and greedily devoured by the demons and witches, although the latter were sometimes regaled with choice meats and expensive wines from golden plates and crystal goblets, but they were never thus favored unless they had done an extraordinary number of evil deeds since the last period of meeting. After the feast, they began dancing again, but such as had no relish for any more exercise in that way, amused themselves by mocking the holy sacrament of baptism. For this purpose, the toads were again called up, and sprinkled with filthy water, the devil making the sign of the cross. When the devil wished to be particularly amused, he made the witches strip off their clothes and dance before him, each with a cat tied round her neck, and another dangling from her body in form of a tail. When the cock crew, they all disappeared, and the Sabbath was ended. This is a summary of the belief which prevailed for many centuries nearly all over Europe, and which is far from eradicated even at this day. It was varied in some respects in several countries, but the main points were the same in France, Germany, Great Britain, Italy, Spain, and the far north of Europe. The belief of the existence of a personal devil was then all but universally entertained. So was the belief of ghosts, apparitions, and spectres. 
there was no more reluctance to think or speak of them than of what we call natural objects and phenomena. Great power was ascribed to the devil over terrestrial affairs, but it had been the prevalent opinion, that he could not operate upon human beings in any other way than through the instrumentality of other human beings, in voluntary confederation with him, and that, by means of their spectres, he could work any amount of mischief. While this opinion prevailed, the testimony of a witness, that he had seen the spectre of a particular person afflicting himself or anyone else, was regarded as proof positive that the person, thus spectrally represented, was in league with the devil, or, in other words, a witch.